Chapter 3. Their Trip Continues. The sea calmed down after a while, and they all joined Dad back at the table. It was going to be a six-hour journey, so they had a lot of time to try not to think about their upset stomachs. Interrupting Dad's book reading, Tarzan asked, So where is this place we're going to? Well, the mystery mansion we're staying at is not as straightforward to get to, answered Dad, putting his book down patiently. Once we get off this ship, we'll be on the main island of a group known as the Porkney Islands, north of Scotland. Then we'll have to travel a bit further and find another smaller ferry terminal and jump onto another smaller boat that'll take about an hour's journey to an even smaller island called Washtray. That's our destination. We'll be truly secluded then. You never know what might happen to us out there, he grinned. But I hear the natives are very friendly. Dad enjoyed teasing his kids every once in a while. As they all found places to rest on nearby benches, Dad reminisced about the time they were all seated in a low-lit cinema ten minutes before the movie was to begin. And his kids had noticed the unfolded white pamphlet with black type he'd been quietly perusing. Dad's own parents being from Canada, he'd taken an interest in Canadian politics at the time. What's that? they'd asked him curiously. Get your own, he said, holding the pamphlet close to his chest. Intrigued, they wanted to know. But what is it? It's a constitution, he'd answered simply. His kids had suddenly felt they were missing out on something worth having. <laughs> For those who don't know what a constitution is, suffice it to say it's a government document and had nothing to do with the particular movie they were about to see. But the kids didn't know that. Where'd you get it? They'd insisted. At the counter, he'd white lied, pointing back up through the open double doors to the lobby where they'd come from. And then, secretly, he followed behind them as they eagerly left their seats, walked back up the aisle and out through the doors, up to the tall counter where they only sold popcorn and candy. Peering up at the confused teenage employee, Hubert innocently asked, Can I have a constitution? <laughs> There was a pause and an awkward response from the pimple-faced youth in the white and pink striped paper hat. I, I don't think we sell that here. But our dad said... Embarrassed, the kids turned away from the counter and then spotted their dad peeking at them from his crouched hiding position behind the double doors, silently laughing himself silly. The kids, far from impressed, ran to him angrily, realizing they'd just been tricked by their dear old dad. But that was a while ago. Dad turned back to his book with a smile on his face. He may not have realized it, but any underlying apprehension he may have been suppressing regarding this trip was, for the moment, held at bay. He spent the rest of the voyage reading while the kids dozed restlessly, scattered about the soft seats. A thousand hours later, the ship's intercom went off again. Bong! Good fine evening, ladies and gentlemen. We trust you enjoyed your crossing. We are now arriving to the Porkney Islands. Please don't forget your belongings, and thank you for travelling with salvaged ships are us. We look forward to seeing you again soon. That took forever, calculated Tarzan rather inaccurately, everyone slowly waking up yawning, groggily stretching cramped muscles. Struggling once again with all their luggage, the family gratefully disembarked from the ship, relieved to get back onto solid, steady ground. Managing to find a taxi waiting for them, they all piled in, Tarzan, as always, making sure to sit immediately next to Melody. To the wash tray boat, please, Dad instructed the curious-looking driver. The driver turned and smiled at them, wearing one of those Scottish tam o' shanters, a tartan hat with a red bauble on top and fake ginger hair attached that all the tourists seemed to just love. Ah, you'll nae want to go there, laddies, assured the driver in a forced accent 
as he eased the vehicle out of the ferry terminal and onto the main road. Oh, Dad questioned. Ah, oh, hi. You know Petey Island life, he explained matter-of-factly. Everyone knows each other's business. Can he mind their own noses? As the taxi continued on, the kids looked out the windows at the strange new landscape passing by. This far north, the late summer evening was finally settling in, making everything look even more eerie than it possibly was. And it took a moment to recognize what was so unusual about this place. They realized there was not a single tree on the landscape, just a whole lot of farms with rusty old sheds, the occasional small derelict stone cottage with empty black windows and ancient roof caved in, standing lifeless in the middle of endless fields. We're here on holiday, replied Dad confidently. We'll be staying at the Harrowing House. Aye, the Harrowing House. Wouldn't they give two tosses for that place? Heard strange things going on there. Surely they've got better things to do with their lives than to play about irresponsibly. Strange things? Melody asked hesitantly from the back seat. Ach, aye, you'll nae want to stay there, lassie, confirmed their bizarre driver, blowing synthetic wispy ginger hair out of his eyes. The kids shivered and huddled closer together in the back, Tarzan not complaining. After they'd paid the taxi fare, hauled all their stuff onto the awaiting vessel, and began the last leg of their journey, night had finally fallen. The fog had rolled in, and strange bird call could be heard floating over the gloomy waters as the small boat puttered along, dark land masses looming occasionally from the mist. They were the only passengers on the ferry, and that certainly did not help them feel any more at ease. And then they arrived. Washtray Island. As the boat drew closer to the concrete dock, from the outer deck they could make out through the darkness a small waterfront village with a few closed shops along the shore. A few solitary street lamps cast their harsh lighting to the ground, causing the area beyond to be even blacker. It looked like a stark movie set from a Stephen King novel. It was very late, and there was not a soul to be seen. The accumulating journey that had started off with one long car drive from home to an equally long, miserable ferry ride, a taxi on a strange island, and then another hour at sea on a smaller boat to an even more remote island equated to the distinct feeling of uneasy isolation. Dad, where have you taken us? whimpered Hubert as they hesitantly made their way off the now still boat and up the narrow ramp. Watching their step, they were careful not to fall over the unguarded sides into the quietly slurping dark waters below. I believe someone was supposed to meet us here, Dad muttered to himself, casting his eyes about the place. The terminal car park was vacant with a suspenseful hush in the air as if something unexpected was about to happen, like a sudden surprise birthday shout, except this wasn't so much fun. Tarzan stuck close by Melody's side. If he hadn't been so busy trying not to drop any of his belongings, he might have even reached for her hand. Through the fog, they heard a snuffle and a creak coming from close by. Instantly, Dad seemed to have acquired additional growths attached to his legs as his kids magnetized straight to him, clutching him tightly for security. Just then, a tall hooded figure in long black robes with a black cord tied around his waist and a pair of heavy black shoes stepped into view. It was a monk, and he was leading a snorting Shetland pony hauling a flat cart behind him. A strong voice spoke from deep within the hood. My apologies for keeping you waiting. You must be very tired. My name is Moses. I understand you'll be staying at the Harrowing House. Observing the hastily abandoned luggage strewn on the ground, the monk motioned to the shuffling pony. This here is Tony. You can put your belongings on the cart and he'll take you to where you need to go. Dad shook Moses' hand. We're very grateful, thank you. The monk then slipped a card from inside his robe 
and handed it to Dad. The number for the Kirk is on there. Don't hesitate to call if there's anything I can help you with. Baptisms, weddings, funerals, exorcisms, you name it, we aim to please. <laughs> with that and no other explanation, he turned and walked back into the dark from whence he came. Um, creepy much, said Tarzan, finding this all very disconcerting. Was that normal? Okay, everyone, get your stuff up onto this cart, instructed Dad, and yourselves too. There's plenty of room. Nothing seemed to faze good old Dad, probably the bravest man on earth. How the hackles does this horse know where we're going, doubted Huey. It's not a horse, corrected Melody. It's a pony, a Shetland pony. They are very short, but very strong. What's the difference, said Huey, not really caring, neglecting to help the others load up their things. More than happy to get off their feet, the kids piled onto the cart and sat comfortably high amidst their bags and cases. This is actually quite fun, they all agreed excitedly. Ah, but don't be fooled by optimistic thinking. Then it began to rain. Heavy, wet drops from an invisible night sky. There was just no avoiding a thorough soaking. Too late. No, groaned the children. Trying vainly to bury themselves beneath luggage, Tarzan and Hugo wrestled over a particularly large suitcase for cover. Melody attempted to shield her glasses from getting wet, as that always made it difficult for her to see. Okay, Tony, encouraged Dad, pulling his coat up closer to his chin. Lead on. With Dad walking confidently alongside, the Shetland pony tromped forward, jerking the cart, causing the three kids to flop back and forth amidst their luggage. Albeit too tired to pay much attention, the wobbling kids were hauled by Tony the pony along a narrow dirt road, leaving hoof prints and cartwheel marks in the mucky path behind them. Leaving the tiny village where they'd found it, they made their way for quite some time past farm fields and farming sheds. Eventually, they came to some hard-to-come-by tree coverage growing from beyond mossy stone walls on either sides of the road, helping to provide a wee bit of shelter. The road turned into a long, private driveway. Through the gloom and the trees, warm lights from a large house could eventually be seen. As they approached, they could make out an old stone, four-story, castle-like dwelling towering high above them. The type of mysterious home one might imagine from spooky children's storybooks. It had turrets and spires, balconies and bay windows, steep roofs and chimneys. It looked so big and grand that it promised any timid child easy opportunity to get lost deep within its walls and rooms, halls and closets, never to be found again. Here we are, announced Dad cheerfully as the pony pulled up alongside the building. Let's get all our things inside and get out of this rain. Like slow limping zombies, the exhausted children plopped down from the cart and, once more, gathered their mountain of belongings together. Why, oh why did we bring so much stuff, complained Hubert, dragging his heavy suitcases off the cart. Maybe you should have left the uke at home, mumbled Tarzan with his head down, trading his bags along the wet grass, his feet trudging towards the concrete steps leading up to the front door. Hugo managed to hug his ukulele case a little closer to his chest. Never, he said, following a few paces behind. Glasses streaming with water droplets, Melody squinted her way after the boys. Of course, as soon as she stepped through the tall antique door and inside, the warmth from the heated interior immediately fogged up her lenses so that she couldn't see anything at all. Not even the strange middle-aged man she accidentally bumped into, who was standing right there. Once Dad had secured Tony inside a nearby shed, he joined his children in the foyer of the house, only to find them standing silently before a stranger. The curious-looking gentleman stood at the foot of a set of stairs wearing a tatty old greenhouse coat and worn slippers. He was bent over slightly, 
with wisps of wild gray hair poking randomly from his balding skull. He eyed them all cautiously. Hello, Dad spoke, moving to the front of the awkward group, offering his hand. We have a reservation here for the week. These are my children, Melody, Hubert, and our friend Tarzan. May we see your rooms, please? We've had a really long journey. The odd-looking fellow opened his badly-toothed mouth. Aye, we've been expecting ye. Welcome to the Harrowing Hoose, a large 200-year-old mansion full of secrets, promising mystery and excitement the whole family can explore. Good luck getting a good night's sleep, he quoted from the crumpled brochure he was holding. My name is Kruger, and I'll be looking after ye during your stay. The kids were distracted by how ridiculously wet his lips were. He seemed oblivious to the spittle leaving his mouth when he spoke. Perhaps he suffered from a particular glandular issue resulting in surplus enzyme production. Surely he must realize it would be beneficial to all involved if he carried a small dabbing towel with him? Right this way, and I'll take you to your rooms, he continued, his mouth a reservoir of excess saliva. Afterwards, ye can come down to the kitchen where I've prepared some food for you. Ye peedy wee darlings must be starved. In the middle of polishing the fog from her glasses, Melody flinched and blinked. Raising her hand, she quietly wiped a wet, unwelcome intruder that had suddenly landed in her eye just as their unusual host had finished speaking. Mm -hmm.